king of sports books comes the king of sports podcasts. Unleashed. Presented by BetMGM. Here's your hosts, Jerry Ferrara and Olivia Harlan Decker. Welcome to Unleashed. The sports calendar is absolutely packed. Oh my gosh. Last weekend, Jerry, it was a lot. I was kind of overwhelmed. I'm not going to lie. The college football chaos, the NFL playoff type games, all these quarterback injuries that could affect some seasons, some betting. Were you overwhelmed? I was overwhelmed, but I I was I couldn't help but think of you because you also were working this weekend. So you throw that into a full NFL and college slate. I, I was right. perusing Instagram. I saw you doing that. We call that like the home alone. You were home alone in it through the airport. Yes. Yeah. So you must have been <laughs> real overloaded. Oh, my God. I was home alone in it. I worked the SEC championship game, which I do every year for like five or six years. I love working that game. My alma mater is Georgia, so it's really fun. They're usually in the game. Five of the last six years they've been in the game, but they'd only won once leading up to this weekend. So it was so exciting. It had been since 2017 since Georgia had won, despite winning a national championship since then. So they had lost in this game. It, 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 it had just evaded them. So it was really fun and like really sweet to get over that hump. Um, and just the game was really exciting. Uh, one of my favorite moments, if I can for a minute, just because this was a fun weekend for me. Uh, there's this really good defensive player for Georgia named Christopher Smith. And he blocked a field goal. And LSU started getting off the field. They thought, you know, it was going to be a turnover. And he just stands there for a minute. He pauses. I don't know if he saw it on social media. And then he starts running. He takes it all the way to the house. And during the game, I'm on my phone and I see this clip is going viral of the Georgia coaches in the press box. And they're going, no, 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 no. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes, yes. And so in my post game interview, I was the first person to talk with Christopher after the game. And I said, when you get back to the locker room and you get on your phone, you're going to see that there's this clip going viral. And I told him about it. He was shocked. And so it was just a really fun moment. But then I had some uh, some key shift moves to do. I leave Mercedes Benz Stadium, which is in downtown Atlanta, and I'm going to Hartsfield Jackson. And, you know, I want to get home and see my baby. I want to wake up at home tomorrow. It's just different when you got a kid. It really is. I used to be able to stay on the road forever. Now I'm dying to get home. and. I'm, I look at my phone. It says we'll get there in like 30 minutes. My flight boards in 15. That's the worst. Jerry, ever. I made my, I made my flight. I made my flight. I still don't know how that was physically possible. Cause the, my flight was boarding as I was in traffic and anyone who knows that airport, it's a mess. It's huge. You had to get some lucky breaks uh, anyways, along the way. I'm guessing you didn't check a bag, right? <laughs> Carry on. No. Nope. Right. Carry on. Carry on. Um, you, your gate couldn't have been too far from security, right? Sometimes you get like a 20 no. minute walk. Yeah. Ha- it was at B gates. And again, we're really in the weeds here. No, right? this is good. <laughs> this knows. is good. Hartsfield Jackson. When you go in through South security, I mean, it, it goes all the way to F. So B, I got a little lucky. I only had two of those like train stops, but then I was at the end of the concourse. That's when I had a home alone it. And I was in heels, Jerry. I was in heels. I had my roller bag. I was in like a blazer. Like I was in like a full work woman outfit and I'm just looking at, um, and you can tell my voice is still a little bit gone because working that game, you know, you're just so excited and you're extending your voice over the crowd, but it was a really, really great weekend. Can't believe I made my flight. Um, and that was the most well-deserved can of wine I've ever had in a plastic <laughs> cup on that flight. That that one tasted really yeah, good. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, I enjoyed this weekend a lot. Obviously, the Giants Commanders game was interesting with the tie, and we'll get into all that. We we have an awesome show. We have Mike Lombardi joining us. Who, I mean, I he has one of those podcasts that you just learn stuff from. Like that's where you go if you really want to learn. I'm not saying we don't teach anything, but if you truly want to learn about the NFL. Uh, so we'll talk to Mike Lombardi about everything that happened this weekend. But, you know, I talk a lot of trash about Sunday, don't have no kids' birthday parties, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I did attend one because I have all this guilt because I'm working like a day job these days with uh, this writer's room that I'm in. I, Sunday, one o'clock, Giants Commanders, I was at Playhouse Square in Cleveland watching Rudolph the Musical. 
<laughs> with my three-year-old son, which was incredible. I'm not going to lie. No. I was 100% oh. watching uh, Red Zone on my phone, and I don't care. No, you were not. I was. Not the whole Very. time, but a lot. And I think that's why they have Wi-Fi in that building. For dads. For, for dads, mom, and whoever. Moms. I, I just like. Was Brie hitting you? Like, put your A little away. bit. Jacob was on her lap, but like, I just kept passive aggressively saying, yeah, you know, it's only the biggest game of the year. That's all. Biggest game for the Giants in five yeah. years. But no, cool. Let's go to Rudolph. All good. All good. And how do you justify it? Because then after you're walking out, I picture she says, so, you know, did the Giants win? Tie. Like, tie. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it would be. She's like, was it worth it? You had to watch a tie. Yeah. So what, what are your takeaways from that game? Um, I don't know if either of those two teams are really good or really bad. I can't figure it out. I think they're both yeah. decent. Uh, it, the glaring thing to me is I, I think that was actually a really positive game for Daniel Jones and the Giants. He made the play to win the game. He hit Slayton on a pass that would the game would have been pretty much over from that point. And Slayton dropped it, second most drops maybe ever. So uh, I do think the tie will help make the playoffs. It's better than the loss, but it just puts that much more pressure on two weeks from now when they play the Commanders again in DC. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a tough no, game. It's interesting. I am definitely one of those people who cheers on Taylor Heineke. I got to admit. And he had 275 yards, uh, 27 completions for 41, two touchdowns. I'm not cheering against your Giants. I'm just saying that Taylor Heineke is a, a great story to get behind. But he, uh, he has his work cut out for him because now all of a sudden there's an, a bigger underdog quarterback in the NFL. Can you even believe what's going on with Sam? Mr. Purdy. Um, huh. Yes. Uh, I, you, I, I mean, it's hard to say you feel bad for Jimmy G, but you do feel bad with every injury. You don't ever want to see players get yeah. injured. I think that was one of the most interesting questions of the year going into the playoffs. If the Niners reach the Super Bowl and or win the Super Bowl, you got to run it back, right? We talked about it last week, and that's something I even want to ask Mike Lombardi. Is it automatic that you run that team back or as much as possible? Now, I just think that, that obviously doesn't happen, but uh, I, Purdy looked good. I'm sorry. That I mean, mm -hmm. the defense looked phenomenal, and they didn't need to do a whole lot, but Purdy did looked very, very competent. Yeah, he looked great. 25 for 34, 210, two touchdowns. But I don't think they're going to need him to do that much. I got to say, that's why I'm not that worried. I'm not sounding the alarms for San Francisco right now. They have one of the best defenses in the league, one of the best coaches in the league on the offensive side of the ball, best left tackle, some of the best playmakers. Um, they're undefeated since Christian McCaffrey came. I, I just, I think that Kyle Shanahan's system has him playing point guard in a, in a basketball sense. Like he doesn't need to take his own shots. He needs to set everyone else up. Um, I really think it's, in, it's interesting, but like you said with Jimmy G, this guy's snake. Yeah. I feel really bad for Jimmy G. I, I was just thinking about his career as a whole leading up to this drafted by the Patriots to be Brady's backup thought maybe it last a couple of years. Okay. Brady's going nowhere. So he goes to San Francisco comes within a play or two of winning the Super Bowl. They draft a young guy third overall. So now he has a second season-ending injury in the last couple of years. I mean, it's a, this guy, he can't catch a break. Thank God he's so pretty, but he, that's kind of it. His football career, he's always just right there, and he gets, he gets screwed. Yeah, and we're coming off that Instagram clip of him at the Warriors game where uh, every single Warriors cheerleader <laughs> walked by and was like, Hi, Jimmy. <laughs> I just kept going. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, do you know much about Brock Purdy? Obviously, I think everyone's done a lot of research since he's been playing and now seems like the 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 guy who's going to be there because I, I don't think they really, I know they signed uh, Johnson off the Broncos practice team, but what right. do you, do you, a, what do you know, if anything, yeah. about Brock Purdy? Well, you know, if it's a guy who's like a rookie for a second, third year, like I probably covered them in college right. and I did. I, I covered Brock Purdy a lot in college, actually. Um, he was at Iowa State. He was really relevant, big name in college football for a handful of years because he played super exciting. He had a big arm. He was confident. He was swaggy. He beat out the guy in front of him like midseason. Um, I, I remember one game, I think he actually was inserted midway through a game I had at Oklahoma State and he was electric. So but that's a college, you know, completely different right. game. Honestly, it, it is a different game in the NFL. Um, but what's kind of cool about him, he got most of his college offers 
really late his senior year because he had mono his junior year. So he didn't play much football. He didn't get many offers. And then he has this amazing senior year. But Iowa State had offered him so early that he wanted to stick with them. So he even turned down a scholarship to play at Alabama. Wow. And others. But Alabama, yeah. like, the, this guy is talented. So much so that Nick Saban wanted him. And, and then he goes to kind of a school no one thinks about, Iowa State, and does well in the Big 12. And, um, yeah, I— I don't think they're done with Brock Purdy. No, and the defense showed you. I mean, it, it was a great example of defense versus offense. The defense was flat out just good enough to beat. Oh. They didn't even need him to do anything. So, But let's just say my Seahawks ticket to win the division, which hit some, which dropped last week, and I was thinking about getting off it, back in play. There's still only one game back from the Niners, and they will yeah. meet again. So that Seahawks to win the NFC West, I know they're the underdog and the, and the Niners are the favorite, but that is still very much in play. Seahawks looked good. Yeah, I was looking at opening odds for that division. So 49ers opening odds was plus 230, and now it's minus 400. Yeah. That's with the Brock Purdy news. So they're still the favorite in the NFC West. Seattle's next up at plus 300 if someone's still trying to buy that ticket. Um, but look, if the playoffs started today, San Francisco would play the Giants. Ugh. and. I think they'd win. I think they'd win too. It's just, yeah. I don't know how with everything the Giants have going on at receiver and lack thereof, I just don't know how they would move the mm -hmm. ball against the Niners. I mean, it, it would have to be a fluky, fluky type that which giant historically Giants and the Niners that hit fluky stuff has happened. Yeah. You know, Joe Montana yep. got knocked out of a game and Colin Kaepernick had an awful game, like his only bad game of the year versus the Giants in the playoffs. So there is a history there, but no, I don't know how the Giants yep. move the ball against that Niners defense. Since they, they, so yeah. now, th now this weekend, we have a much anticipated, a uh, uh, just classic on the gridiron meeting, Brock Purdy and Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, listen, two very what? late draft. I mean, Brock Purdy potentially yeah, yeah. could be, uh, look, you can't say he's going to be Tom Brady. But he has the origin story, at least so far, you know, right. He was Mr. Irrelevant. Right. But let's just let's just be clear. If San Francisco makes a deep playoff run here with Brock Purdy at quarterback, this is we need to have Jeff Perlman write his book now. Just start it now, because this would be the most unheard of thing. It's never happened in the NFL before. And you look at Tom Brady, what he was a six round pick, six or seven. Yeah, I always get confused if he was six or seven. I think I think six and Brock Purdy was literally the last pick in the draft, Mr. Irrelevant. Th that's kind of a different story. I mean, that's, that is falling so far. And he's a rookie. He's a rookie. It's not like he's been like th an eternal backup that, you know, is competent, whatever. He's a rookie and he was Mr. Irrelevant. So this story would be incredible if they can, if they can play with him. I, yeah. And you know, Brady, if you remember people forget, cause he's been around for a hundred thousand years. That, that first Patriots Super Bowl, oh, all you got to do is just manage the game because the Pats had a good defense. They yeah. had a good run game. Yeah. They had a great coach. So uh, th there are eerie things, but let's not get ahead of ourselves because although Tom Brady, for every moment that you're like, oh, he's done, the Bucs are done, and he does some crazy stuff with three minutes to go, it is awful watching the Bucs. I, I, I hate, I'm like hate watching the Bucs all the time. I mean, that Monday night game was unprecedented i would love to know the viewership from like at the final five minutes when they were down 13 tampa bay and then they come back obviously to win i would love to know how many tv sets were turned off i sound like i'm in the 1960s right now <laughs> what's the <laughs> really, nielsen how many, rating how many people had <laughs> how many people had turned off the game and then quickly turned it back on at the end when you know someone texts them are you watching this <laughs> so you just reminded me of my when when Entourage first started, my mom would put like all the TVs on in the house with Entourage on, thinking that each TV oh, would that count is so as cute. like a viewer. So uh, oh. yeah, okay, that's adorable. By the way, later in the show, we are going to get back to our Entourage segment. We missed last week because I was traveling and I didn't have time to watch, but now I am caught up and I have so many questions to ask you later in the show. Can't wait. Like, yeah, I think you're entering season five, which is my second favorite season. So I'm yep. excited to, to have a little Ooh. chat about it. Oh, OK. Um, I wanted to ask you, too, on the heels of the 49ers conversation, um, and we do record this on Tuesday, so this might be settled by the time this airs on Thursday. But Baker Mayfield was cut from Carolina this week, and a lot of people thought, oh, perfect timing. San Francisco needs a quarterback. Baker's a former number one pick. He's a former Heisman winner. 
you know, he there's still something to like with Baker Mayfield. I know he's got a lot of haters, but he can play. Um, It's sad that he fell to third string in Carolina. I don't really know how or why, but do you feel like San Francisco is a good spot for him? And we'll ask Michael Lombardi, but do you feel like there's any team that could use his services? Uh, Look, with the way quarterback was this year, I I definitely don't think that Baker necessarily needs to worry, like, will he get another shot or not? I think he will. I don't think it's going to be with the Niners unless it's it's going to be an insurance package almost for them because I, I think they're going to roll the dice with Purdy. I think they probably liked what they saw, and yeah. he's been with the team. He's been the backup while he was third string, but then Trey Lance went down so early, he's been getting reps as the backup quarterback for a minute. So I don't, I don't see it happening unless truly they want to just bolster up the, the quarterbacks. But I don't, I don't think it happens with them. I don't think they need it. And yeah. the Josh Johnson part of it all, who he knows, you know, he knows the LaFleur, so he knows the system. So I, I just don't, I just don't see it. And I don't know what team really does that. Why not, why not just wait and then bring him in for workouts and talks and sign him in the off season? Cause you don't even, even if they sign him and Lombardi could speak to this better than I can, you know, you don't have his rights for next year. So why not just wait? I don't see, I don't think there's any other team that's, just close enough where Baker would put them over the edge. The Niners would be the only team, but I don't even think it, I don't think it happens. Do you? Yeah. Um, no, I don't because they asked Kyle Shanahan about it on Sunday or Monday. And he was like, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of Baker's, which is not true. I'm a fan of <laughs> Baker's, but, uh, I think we're okay, which yeah. I think says it all, but Hey, it's not his decision. So we'll see. Okay. There's one more quarterback. Qualm, I wanted to pick your brain on. So I, we haven't talked about this before. I, w- I want to air this out and see what you think. And we'll ask Michael Lombardi too. But just as I'm kind of looking at where the Packers stand with Aaron Rodgers and everyone's like, oh, the Packers are stuck with them. They're stuck. And recently both sides came out saying they want to him to return next year. I feel like, and I, I again, I'm not a GM, <laughs> obviously, and I don't know if this really is the best solution, but it is a solution. And I just want to, I, I, I want to th- hear what you think about this. So Tennessee, they are right there. They are ready to win. They have a great defense, good coaching. I think could use a better quarterback. Aaron Rodgers is building a house in Nashville. Now, a lot of people do end up moving to Lasville, Nashville. We were just talking before the show, like a lot of Californians move to Austin. <laughs> this is a similar thing. But as the Packers and Aaron just signed a three-year, $150 million extension, And the only way out of it is really retirement. I wonder if he would try to get traded or retire and then unretire and try to go to Nashville where he could probably win more games sooner. And then I don't know if it necessarily is horrible for the Packers because they'd get a bunch of draft picks. They would hit dead cap space, but it'd be like 16 million the first year, 25 million the next year. But if Jordan Love can play, which again, we don't really know, I think it's a wash because you're not paying Jordan Love. You're not paying all the young guys like Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs. The only like big money guy on that team is David Bakhtiari, your left tackle. So if you get all these draft picks from Tennessee, you get a receiver that hits, then you can kind of even get rid of the next level of money guys like Randall Cobb, Sammy Watkins, Alan Lazard. And again, this may be complete BS I'm spitting out here. I just feel like it kind of fits for both sides and it gives Green Bay a fresh start. I think that is a really, really good case that you just laid out because when you think of Aaron Rodgers, look, with with Green Bay, they're going to get a good draft pick this year, but that's only one pick and they'll have a a better second round pick. So they, they will have assets to make the team better going into next year. I get all. And Watson obviously has shown remarkable bounce back factor since his start of the year. Oh so gosh. he's a piece too. Um, it's, it's a really interesting scenario because I do think that's a Have great, you thought about that before. I haven't thought of the Titans till you, yeah. you mentioned it, but, uh, and I did clock the building a house. I don't really ever, I think the only time that ever truly factored in was when LeBron was building like his mega giant mansion in LA. It's like, yeah, cause he's going <laughs> yeah. to the Lakers. Like what? Well, well, not a surprise, but I think for a lot of these guys, just because they're building a house somewhere, it does not automatically plant that they're oh, going. Yeah, no, but I think I you it brought you to a good, a yeah. good point because <laughs> it is a good fit. And 
they the Titans are really close. I I like Tannehill. I don't and I kind of would say see how it goes with Titans this year if they make a run with Tannehill then who knows, but if they get bounced out early, I would much if I was him, I'd much rather uh play in that division than uh have to deal with the Vikings and the Lions who look like they're officially a juggernaut <laughs> coming in. I mean, they, they, it, it's insane to see what the Lions have put together. I can't believe that the Lions are favored at home against the Vikings. Someone tell me why. I think the Lions are making the playoffs. What? Well, I looked into it. I do. It. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I would love to hear your case because I, I sniffed around at that too. They're basically two games out. Yeah. And, I, and their schedule, they are obviously uh, home for the Vikings this week. So if they win this week, then I do think you are in business. Then they go at the Jets, which is no longer yep. a, walk ga- a walkover game because Mike White Not has something all. to say about that. At the Panthers, the Panthers are so confusing. They're one of these teams I can't figure out. Like they flirt with you, oh like gosh. we might be good. And then they just are like, ah, they just ghost you because then they suck. So I don't know what happens in that game, but then home against the Bears, final game of the season in Green Bay against your yeah. potentially Jordan Love Packers. And potentially just dead in the water Packers. Uh, I, d- d- yeah. They're already dead in the water. Honestly, yeah, every no, game they win only hurts them at this <laughs> point. It's just the truth. Yeah. It's just the truth. It, I know. I know. But we had to beat Chicago. Yes. Like that, one, that one had to happen. They call but no, I hear you. I think the Lions beat Chicago and Green Bay. I think they certainly can beat the Panthers. Um, could they still get in the playoffs if they lose to the Vikings and Jets? I don't win know. The next that three? will put them at, uh, let's see, they're five and seven. If they go three and two. So if the they go three games. and two, I don't know. Huh? Eight and nine? Yeah. I don't think that gets in because right now you got the Giants seven, four and one, Commander seven, five and one, Seahawks seven and five. It's a, it's a two game chase. So, okay. It'd be tough to, there was a few winnable games yeah. the Lions had earlier in the year, but I am just blown away and, Fans listening to this show, if you are willing to lay, I, I, I mean, everyone's going to take the Vikings. This is going to be insane. The Vikings are plus two and a half. The Vikings are what, 11 and one? I don't even know the 10 and two, whatever their record is. This is crazy. <laughs> this is absolutely crazy. Suspect line. Do you think Peter Andrews going to hit on that one in our final segment? I don't know what we could leave it to Peter Andrew because uh, I think he had the giant. He so lucky. He I think he had the uh, over. No, he had the under 40 and a half and the game ended in a 20 20 tie. So he won yeah. by the half point. <laughs> like He was rooting for the tie in overtime. Oh, oh my God. Oh, certainly he was not the only one. So what do you mean these teams that are flirting with you? What do you mean by that? I mean, from a betting perspective, the teams that just look, when you look at the lines from the beginning of the year till now, it's like, this is my team. Like if it's like relationships, I I ran this whole bit out in my mind of just the teams that I've had relationships with this year, flirty, we're dating, we're not relationships and where they end. Like for instance, Jacksonville, Jacksonville Jaguars are that exact team that you actually think you're dating them and they just ghost you completely. You never hear from them again. Like they win two weeks ago and then they get absolutely crushed by the Lions. The Raiders are the team you want nothing to do with, but now you moved on. They're like, hey, wait, we, we want to actually date you because you're looking at other teams now. <laughs> you, the Vikings are always screwing up and apologizing and you always forgive them. The Vikings, they're oh, always down. I like that one. Yeah, That's good. They're just that team. They're like, oh, so sorry. No, I was supposed to meet you. I'm sorry. It won't happen again. You forgive them. Of course it happens yeah. again. And then I think <laughs> there's a team like the Steelers who earlier in the year, yeah, I think the Steelers are that team. They got like a makeover. They, they like, they got in shape. They bought some clothes. They got their hair done. Like the Steelers all of a sudden walked in the room one day and you're like, oh, damn, look at the Steelers. Because <laughs> they're, they're, they're kind of hot right now. Yeah, Steelers are kind of hot right now. Yeah, I think Steelers just got a nose job. Or <laughs> they, they've had some work done. <laughs> they had they've some had work some done. work done. Um, Do you have a okay, team that like that? Really Do you have a, is there one team for you on a betting perspective well, that you've been in a relationship with that it's been rocky? Well, now that you've thrown out this whole narrative, and I'm, I'm liking it, and I'm following you here, what about the Titans? <sighs> they've won five straight, and their streak was stopped by a strong Chiefs tam- team who just beat them by three at home. But then they won two again since that. And they're looking strong, leading their division. 
and then a home loss by four to Cincy. And then what they did in Philadelphia is unacceptable. 35 to 10 loss, AJ Brown's revenge game, all of that. Um, so I don't know. What's the, I got it. What's the dating I got equivalent it. You there? Ready? What? Okay. What? The Titans yeah. were at the bar and oh. wow, did they look hot. They were the hot guy or the hot girl at the <laughs> bar. Everyone's eyes are on them. Yeah. And then it hits 2 a.m. Can't serve alcohol anymore. Lights, Lights on. come on. And you're like, oh, yeah. God, whoa, you were way hotter when the when the bar had the lights off. That's what happened because everyone bet the Titans this oh. week. Everyone bet the Titans this week. <laughs> everyone took the points with the Titans. Then they turned the they lights did. on. It's like, they yeah, did. whoa. That game should have been much more competitive than it was. No, you are so right. That is the equivalent. Also, anyone who's been in that position, whether it's someone you're talking to or you're all of a sudden self-conscious about you, that's a horrible moment when the lights turn on <laughs> in a bar. <laughs> Listen, I... I, you're like oh my god these are just jokes my, everyone like for a girl yeah, these are just jokes I'm like, everyone is my eye makeup everywhere do i need yeah oh it's horrible okay <laughs> <laughs> um okay a big story this week in college football was coach prime Dion sanders he was named the new head coach at university of colorado so he turned jackson state into a winner now he's headed to the pac-12 try to replicate that in boulder um i was really surprised by this just because i thought his coaching career was going to be to really help HBCU. Like I thought that was the point of bringing his celebrity, all of that to HBCU, turn a program around, shape young men. I didn't think he was trying to climb the coaching ranks, to be honest. I I didn't think that's what he was getting into it for. Um, Clearly that is what he's doing. And I think it's incredible. I, I think it's anyone who's a hater of this move, it's really hypocritical because all we do is say that black head coaches need more opportunities. And then he here he is climbing the ranks, taking this power five job. And I just saw a lot of people being like, you know, how dare he leave, you know, Jackson State after after recruiting all those guys and getting them there. But I'm a fan of this move. Go coach prime. I'm so excited to watch Colorado next year. Um, And I actually I have a speaking gig coming up in January with Deion Sanders that was booked like a month ago (laughs) before this happened. So I really hope he still makes it. (laughs) Yeah, I think he will because he's coming. He's he told me he's coming. Ooh, yeah, we got a uh, we loved his meeting with his new players so much that we thought of a new segment for the show and it's called Audible of the Week. So go ahead and listen for yourself. No. OK. Not to compete, but to win. Not to show up, but to show out. Not to be amongst the rest, but to be the best. I'm coming. I'm flat out coming. We got a few positions already taken care of because I'm bringing my luggage with me. And it's Louis. But I told him I want these kids focused on the NFL, not the NIL. But guess what they told him? They're coming. I love the line when he says, be focused on the NFL, not NIL. And that's so refreshing. Everything about him is so refreshing. Like he he's every I think people in this day and age, regardless of industry or or whatever, people just tiptoe around feelings and everyone has to be like so woke and blah blah. I feel like he's like old school. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh in a in a in an era too where we've seen every version of a coach's like rah rah speech or introduction, we've seen yeah. every version of it. Have not seen this version of it. It was awesome. No. And look, I'm just, I think he's going to do great over there. I just think I'm a big believer in, I think some, some people, athletes, actors, reporters, whatever your job is, just need to feel believed in. And I feel like if you get Coach Prime to believe in you, I, I, feel, I feel like the confidence level, you'll, you'll probably get to do extraordinary things you didn't think you can do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a guy you want behind you. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited. So that'll be fun. End of January, we'll <clears throat> come back to this topic, um, and I'll ask you what I should ask him, because I'm like emceeing an interview with him on stage for a, a National Auto Dealers Conference. I'm, re- I'm really excited. He'll be fascinating. Let's bring in our guest. He's a former NFL general manager who won three Super Bowl rings during his time in the NFL. And when he's not breaking down film of NFL games, he's breaking down actual film from The Godfather (laughs) to Goodfellas. 
host of the GM Shuffle podcast, which is amazing, by the way, if you haven't listened, Michael Lombardi is here again, a second appearance. Thank you so much for joining, Michael. I appreciate it. Good to be here, Jerry. Nice to meet you. I'm a big fan. Uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy it. It's uh, It was always a, a good time to watch that show and uh, kind of live a life we all wish we lived. I mean, you know, you're a dream come true right there, that show. Well, you know? I appreciate that. Uh, I, I've been a fan of yours for a while. And also, I, you are someone who's on my list. Like, I want to have dinner with you because I want to like, I, less, I want to talk football, but I'm more interested to talk. I'm a big Sopranos guy. I, I've watched that show yeah. 97 times through and all the movies. Like, I just would love to do movie and show deep dives with you because uh, I love when you do that. Stuff. I would love that. You, you know, I think what makes that show so from from a writing standpoint for me and I'm not a writer and, and I, I have an idea for a, 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 a show, but it, I haven't been able to sell it. But I think what makes that show so unique and so continuous that in our minds is every time he goes to see uh, Dr. Melfi, the show can take on a different life. So the therapist sessions, although somewhat annoying and tedious, they really directed the show and she wrote the show. And that's what makes it so much fun to watch because. She controlled the narrative of the entire six seasons by her being in that office. And yet, yet we don't realize that, you know, it's kind of fun. And that's what I loved about it. Yeah. Uh, before we get into some fun football stuff, right when I moved to L.A., I had an audition for one line on The Sopranos, which was for the Jackie Jr. part. No one knowing how much of a big character it would become. I had my tickets booked. I'm like, do I stay in New York for this one one line thing that's going to be nothing or move to L.A.? And I just went to L.A. and I didn't oh, go on no. the audition. And that part did become a thing, as you remember. So, Oh, no. <laughs> Shoot, you could have almost drowned in three inches of water like Jackie Jr. did. <laughs> I mean, seriously. You could have, I mean, that's one of the Uncle <laughs> Jr.'s greatest lines. He's got the napkin on his thing. He's at the kid's wake and he said the dumb fuck almost drowned in three inches of water, you know? So it's not... Every time I see Jackie Jr., I, that's all I can think about. Yes, agreed. Oh, God, you got me there. <laughs> that's an interesting uh, decision there, Jerry, but a good good backstory. And I want to know the backstory, too, because we were just talking off air about the Seahawks tweet with Pete Carroll and the entourage yeah. and everything. And, Jerry, you were saying that there's something more there. And then, Michael, I think you have a take as well. Yeah, I mean, look, I think Seattle, I, I, I said on my podcast all summer, and I apologize to Pete Carroll and to John Schneider. I said, I don't know how they could go on vacation knowing Geno Smith was their quarterback. And <laughs> Geno's proved me wrong. I mean, like, Geno's played really well. I think they actually thought Drew Locke would win the job. But Geno's, I mean, Geno was accurate. I mean, his pocket presence yet last weekend was tremendous. He stepped up. He made great throws. They turned the ball over, or else the game wouldn't have been as close. They turned it over twice in the in the, in the Ram territory. but. I, I think that I think there was this perception that Russell needed to cook. It's always was somebody else's fault in Seattle. You know, it was Daryl Bevel's fault. They fire him. It was Brian Schottenheimer's fault. They fire him. They bring Shane Waldron in. Oh, no, he's no good. You know, you got to let Russ cook. You know, and there was a time Russ was cooking at the French Laundry. But slowly, Russell became the, the chef at the Hackensack Diner. And now I'm not sure he's I'm not I'm not even sure he's cooking in cafeterias in high school. Like, it's just not the same guy. Like And I think that that relief for Seattle is almost like this giant cloud got lifted off their shoulders. Yeah, I, all I'll say is, you know, Russell Wilson was in the Entourage movie. At one point, he was very close with our show creator, Doug Ellen, who has oh. since been iced out of, from Russell Wilson's life. Like, they were really close. And one day, I think Russell just, wow. they actually talk about it on their podcast, uh, Victory, the podcast. So I definitely think that, yeah, that had a lot of, Russell Wilson connotation to it. And of course, I was on the Ravens a little bit in that game. He finally scrambled, which I thought was crazy when the game was on the line. He had a nice run, which I don't think we saw all year. We've seen all year long. You know, when they made the trade, I said, you know, like, look, everybody thinks this is, you know, one thing that happens in sports is a player beats a really good player. And then people just think he stays great forever. Like, everybody just assumes Odell Beckham's going to come back and be Odell with the one-handed catch in New York. Like, Odell's coming off a second ACL, you know, and he's going to have a hard time getting up to the level that Odell once played at. Let's just be fair. Like, he's not going to play at the highest level. I mean, Chris Godwin, just last night, they were saying, Brady was saying to the announcers that Godwin is just finally back from his ACL, right? And he's been practicing football for six months. So, like, we just assume a player's great and he's going to stay great forever. And... 
I think when you watch Russell last year, he, the lowest run at rushing total he had in his career was 183 yards. That was last year. He didn't run last year. There's a yeah. reason they don't run quarterback sneak, you know, and he doesn't want to run. And when Russell can't make those plays and Olivia, like, I think, you know, being married to a basketball player, you can appreciate this. Like to me, when I watch Russell, I'm reminded of Allen Iverson. Iverson was a little guy who was great. He had an incredible burst to the basket. Nobody could handle his quickness. But when he lost that little bit of quickness and lost that burst, he became a little player. I think that's what's happened to Russell. He doesn't have the juice in his lower body. And now all of a sudden, he's, you can catch him. He can't escape from you. He, can, he can't escape. And he looks like a little player playing quarterback. Okay, that's interesting. I want to stick with OBJ for a second because – Rumors are, as we record this Tuesday, he just wrapped up meetings in Dallas with Jerry Jones, with the leadership group that includes Dak Prescott, went to a Mavericks game with some of the guys. He sounded like it's all but done. Jerry Jones sounded a little bit more trepidatious. What are you hearing? I mean, I think to me, nobody's going to know what the reality of the situation is until they examine the knee. Where is he in his rehab? What does he look like in a workout? You know, last night they were talking on the television, it's going to be really expensive to sign Odell. Yeah, it might be, but... If he's only if he can pass a physical mm -hmm. like is it, he's got to be able There's one thing I learned in my career in the NFL. The doctors will say he's passed a physical, but that doesn't mean he's ready to play at the NFL's highest level. That just means he can start rehab. That just means he can start preparing. We only got five weeks left. Now, if you're signing him and you think it's going to help you in the playoff run. OK, but you're not going to get as much out of him as you think. It's going to take time. Look how rusty Rus Deshaun Watson was. I mean, it's going to take time to get back into the flow of the game, the physicality of the game. And you're coming off a knee injury, a major significant ACL, which is the second one you've suffered. I know he's superhuman. I know he's a talented player, but I think it's hard. You, you mentioned Godwin, and I want to stick with the Bucs because I, I was, we, we were joking earlier of how we wonder what the ratings of, of that game were for three and a half quarters versus the final five minutes of that game when it just turned into like, oh, Tom Brady's doing his thing. I don't know if that's what Tom Brady envisioned when he came back, uh, but it's ugly win after ugly win and uglier loss after uglier loss. I, what do you think the Bucks' offense, like, why have they struggled so much? Is, is, was Gronk that much of a factor? Is it health of Godwin or all of the above? Well, I, I think if you understand quarterbacks, the quarterbacks are like basketball players. There's certain spots on the field that they, they shoot the ball well from, just like certain spots on the court, right? And Brady wants to throw the ball in the middle of the field. You saw it last night. Every time he threw a nine route, it really wasn't what he wants to do. He wasn't accurate with it. He missed it. It's just not his strength. His strength is the between the numbers. And when you look at his career over his extended time in New England, he always had a nickel running back. You start with Kevin Falk, Shane Vereen, James White. He always had tight ends, Ben Watson, you know, Gronk, Aaron Hernandez, and he always had a slot receiver, Wes Welker, Danny Amadola, Julian Edelman. He's always had three players who could control the middle of the field. He's in Tampa now. He doesn't have that. He's got Godwin. Everybody keeps wanting to get the ball to Mike Evans, but Mike Evans doesn't run routes that are really complementary to Brady's game. And so to me, it's a design problem with their personnel. Like they don't have the ability to, to have the, the guys inside that can win one-on-one -on -one routes. And last night, they got the biggest break of all. I mean, if Mark Ingram gets the first down, if anybody was awake for it, if he just gets the first down, they're going to run two more minutes off the clock. And I don't think Brady's going to have time to come back down the field to score two touchdowns. OK, so we now know that Lamar Jackson sprained his PCL. He's definitely out this weekend against the Steelers, and it may be up to three weeks. Look, a lot of people are saying he should hold out and wait for some guaranteed money, wait for the Ravens to make a move. Why do you think the Ravens are dragging their feet? And what do you think is the best course of action for Lamar? Well, I, I think that the Sean Watson contract really threw a loop into it. With Deshaun getting $250 million guaranteed, buttoned up, the first NFL player in the history of this sport to ever do that. You know, when I was in the league, nobody was getting any buttoned up contracts. It's still until Deshaun. When I say buttoned up, that means skill and injury. A lot of players get skill con guarantees. They get injury guarantees. When you get both, the owners then have to fund the money to the league office in, a, in an escrow account, which it really hurts their cash flow, no matter how wealthy anyone is. So they've always been able to use this 1960 rule, which was essentially put into place because they, they want the owners to cheat the players and go bankrupt and say, oh, I know we owed you money, but now we're bankrupt. I mean, the NFL was never this incredible machine that it is today. So that rule was put into basically to help the players not get ripped off. And now there's, that's a 1960 rule that stayed intact. 
And then the Browns violated it. They went above and beyond for a player that had a lot of off the field issues that was suspended. You know, of all the players to get that type of deal, Watson should have been the last one. And he did. And De Lamar wants that deal. And Steve Bashotti came right out after the deal happened and said, that's really bad for our game. And I think there's the conflict. I think Lamar is, is they're going to have to pay Lamar. I, I, to me, I don't like Baltimore's passing game. Even when Lamar was the MVP in the league, their passing game wasn't good enough. It, and it showed up when they played Tennessee in a playoff game. They've got it. And Lamar's a lot like Tom Brady. He wants to throw the ball in the middle of the field. That's why Mark Andrews was so good. When he had Hayden Hurst and Mark Andrews inside, they were more dynamic. They keep signing little receivers on the outside. When, when you watch Lamar play at Louisville and you watch him play in any game, he's a better inside the number thrower. And so to me, I don't know what his mindset will be. Do I come back? I know he's a competitor. But to me, I think their offense has been broken. Everybody wants Lamar to play out of shotgun. I want Lamar to be under center. I want him to fake a handoff. I want him to roll out. I want him to play bootlegs. I want him to be more of a, a traditional quarterback than this, this RPO guy. And their offense, you know, frankly, they, if they don't run the ball, they can't move the ball. Look, we, I, I say on this pod all the time, we know MVP is basically a quarterback award, which bothers me. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've listened to you many times on your pod talk about like how Tyreek Hill even is just the MVP at the very least of the Dolphins, right? I've heard you say that. I can't yeah. agree more. I'm finally at the point. I'm ready to see it. I'm ready to see a non-quarterback MVP. I don't think it'll ever happen. But in your opinion, who do you think, if you could take quarterbacks out of the equation, who is Michael Lombardi's MVP if it is a non-quarterback award? I mean, let's just take the first play of the San Francisco game. If you want to understand how great Tyree Kill is and how he tilts the field, he motions across the formation. Sheffield's standing on the line. He motions across the formation. Two guys run with him. He starts to run down the seam. San Francisco's so worried about him going down the seam, they forget to cover Sheffield. He catches an eight-yard pass for a 75-yard touchdown. The guy tilts the field. I mean, he tilts the field. He's hard to defend. Coverages have to go to him. And even when he's covered, he still makes a play, and he's got in, insane quickness. I mean, for a guy who's as fast as he is, he's got really incredible quickness. I mean, you could have this conversation about Justin Jefferson. I mean, where would Minnesota be without Justin Jefferson? I, I don't know. You know, like these guys are tilting the field in their favor, and they're really helping them. I mean, obviously, Jalen Hurts has done a remarkable job, and, and, and last week proved it against Tennessee that he can throw the football. But I'm with you. I think if there's one player outside of the quarterback position, I think it's Jefferson and Tyreek Hill. Mm, I like that. Um, Jefferson, especially as you look at what the Vikings are doing, um, they're 9-0 and in one-score games. They're a, a scary team to bet, as we are a betting show. Uh, yeah. But when you actually look at what they're going to do in the postseason, what sticks out to you that's going to make this team you know, make or break them? You know, they're like the TCU of, of pro football. Nobody <laughs> yeah. doubts it. I mean, they go into Detroit. They're a dog this week against Detroit. They're all I know yeah. is win, so right? Amazing. So I do a power ranking every week on my show on Visa, and, uh, and, and I do 19 categories of what I think determines the outcome of winning. And, and when you break down the Vikings and just take the Jet game last week, I mean, they do the things you have to do to win. They play great in the red zone, right? They control the middle eight. I mean, when Salai goes for it on fourth down in his own territory – they get three points out of the deal. Now, the Jets came back and scored, but those three points that, that, that Salai ended up giving them end up being the difference in the game because the, they, the Jets didn't manage the middle eight correctly when they had the football. So to me, the Vikings play really good at red zone. They're really good on third down. They're situational aware. When the, when the, when the Jets came back to make it a 20-15 to 15 game and they said that momentum, seven play drives, 75 yards, touchdown. They're timely. Their offense is timely. I, I, I just think, to me, the more you win games in the NFL, the more resilient you become. Now, do, could they lose against Detroit? Absolutely. Their defense gives up a ton of yards. But they're hard to score on, and they're hard to convert third downs on at times during the game. And their offense is very timely. I mean, the Miami game, to me, was unbelievable. Even though Miami was playing a backup quarterback, I mean, they had 15 drives in the game. They punted 13 times in Minnesota. I wanted to ask you about this too. We do record this Tuesday. So by the time this airs Thursday, we may have our answer. But as Baker Mayfield is going through the process today, Tuesday, um, of clearing waivers, is there a situation that you think fits both him and a team? And is it the 49ers? So he's got a million three of salary coming to him, right? So if you take him on, you, that you, you take on that salary. 
Mm-hmm. So if for the for the 49ers to take him on, they're saying he's an insurance policy. Would they do that? I don't think so. I mean, if you watch Baker play this year, he did not play, he has not played well. He did not play like the first pick overall in the draft. He missed open receivers. He didn't really have great sense of timing, whether it's Carolina's offense or him. I'm not sure. You know, the Texans, if they if they claimed him, they could sign him. He won't know their offense. It may take a week or two to get him up to speed. And then he's a free agent at the end of the year. So he automatically you don't have him for next year. Would the Rams sign him considering Matthew Stafford's back problems? And I think Matthew Stafford considering retirement. Again, the Rams would give up a million three of cap room, something they don't have, to sign a quarterback that probably isn't going to play right away for them. And then they lose cap room for next season. So, uh, and then not have him under contract. I I think he clears the waiver wire. I would be surprised unless Houston claimed him. I mean, look, Houston's a disaster. I mean, they're not very good. They've gotten worse this year than they were last year. You know, and I know it. You know, it's another first-year head coach. But I mean, in eight in eight years that Lovey Smith's been a head coach, two in Tampa, five in Illinois, and then this year he's twenty-six, seventy-three, and one. I mean, he hasn't been able to fix it as a head coach. And you have to imagine Houston's going to be going quarterback, and they're going to be having Baker's old old team's pick, so they're going to have a lot of options at the QB spot in the draft. So. I, I want to go to New York for a second. I, I didn't want to do this to you, but I got to get some giant stuff in there. <laughs> um, I'm struggling with the Giants in the sense of I'm obviously thrilled with the way the season's going. I'm thrilled with Coach Dable and Saquon and all that, but basically the long term plans and the contracts going forward. Daniel Jones is Mister. Like we need to see, you need to prove it. But how could you judge him? when your number one receiver is Darius Slayton, who dropped the biggest play of the game that would have iced the game versus the commanders. I'm basically asking you about Daniel Jones and Saquon going forward. Well, how do you handle that giant situation? Well, I mean, I think they've done a great job of managing Daniel Jones, right? So they, they basically said, look, we're going to run a six-back offense. We're going to use Daniel Jones in the, in the running game a little bit to offset that. We're going to try to throw a lot of short passes so we get a lot of completions. And we're going to try to convert as many third downs as we can and slow the game down. We're not very talented. And I think they've, Daniel Jones in this system has played well. The problem is how much do you pay him in this system? Do you pay him 35 over two? Do you pay him 40 over two? If it gets to 30, uh, if it gets to 60 over two, is he worth that? He's not, he's not winning any games. So that's a hard decision. Saquon's not as hard. The question is how much do you want to pay a running back? I think that's really the issue. And they've got so many needs. I think what Brian has done for the Giants, he's come up with a formula for them to win. They're well coached offensively. They're well coached defensively. They typically play well in the red zone against, you know, like Houston. They had a chance to lose against Houston, but they played so well in the red zone. They didn't. Detroit, they didn't play well in the red zone. So their formula is really the why they're winning. And if they break that formula, they're not going to win. And so to me, that tells you there's a value for Daniel Jones, but it isn't at a, at a normal quarterback rate. I think it's going to come down to that. I think they've got to improve at the quarterback position to get somebody who they feel like they can put more of the game on him, whereas right now they're managing Daniel Jones. Real quick, because we'll stick in New York for one more second, because I love uh, hating on my Jet fan friends. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's where I was going to get to. <laughs> yeah, it's just like... You know, I'm looking at, I call him a kid because I'm 43. He's not a kid. He's a, he's a young man. Zach Wilson. Uh, I get it. He has not been. He's 23. He's 23. Uh, and he's out of a job. Out of a job? Like, is he out of a job for the Jets in general? Or, you know, like, I don't know what his future is. And can it be just that press conference that did him in? And the team's wearing Mike F and White t-shirts getting on the plane. That's as bad as I've seen it in a while. Yeah. I don't think it was the press conference. I think his interaction with the team, if you watch the games, you could tell. It's like Kyler Murray's interaction with his teammates. I mean, they can all talk that, you know, he they love him as a teammate. Watch the interactions. You know, mm-hmm. you know, you can feel it. You can see it. It's just like Tyler Heineke. You know, he's not the best player for Washington, but the players gravitate to him. They like him. You know, they really believe in him. And I think it's the same thing with Mike White. They believe in him. He's not the best player. He, if you watch Mike White work out and Zach work out, you would say Zach's the better player. But Zach doesn't doesn't really build any confidence with his teammates. He's a little aloof. He's not very mature. His mind seems to be other places, and he's not taking the game as serious as he needs to take it. He hasn't grown up. It's happens to a lot of guys that are second pick in the draft, third pick in the draft. Mm-hmm. You know, Geno Smith was this way when he came out. He wasn't really mature enough to handle the situation. And over time, he's now become a talented player uh, and more mature. I, I think that's the problem. I mean, Zach's got two more years of highly guaranteed money. They got to try to rehabilitate him. I don't know if they can because 
His personality isn't endearing to his teammates. You know, when I used to go into the in, in the Patriots, when you used to go into the Patriots kitchen, cafeteria, you know, Brady would be sitting there with the offensive lineman. Garoppolo would be sitting there with the – there was a – you could tell the players liked the quarterback. And then when Brady got hurt, got suspended, everybody wanted to lift up Garoppolo and move forward. There, there's a bond that has to be created with the with the quarterback. And it doesn't have to be necessarily the best player on the team. He's got to be able – the player's got to believe him. And I think Heineke leads them. I think White will lead them. And, and, I, and I, think, I think that's the key. And, and I think that's the bigger issue. Speaking of Garoppolo, that is something you always hear with him, that he's a well-liked guy. He's the type of guy you want to go grab a beer with. Like that has gone a long way in this league. It's amazing yeah. that the layman would believe that. But looking at what San Francisco has to deal with now, do you think, and to bring up the Baker Mayfield part of it again, by skipping any affiliation with Baker, does that say more about their trust in Brock Purdy or more of their disinterest in bringing in another quarterback besides who they just got as a veteran backup? Well, I think they watched Baker, and he wasn't very good. I mean, Brock Purdy played better in that game on Sunday yeah. than Baker played for the six games in Carolina. That's just a fact. Uh, and I think this: I think you got to go with what you have. When Tom Brady got hurt in New England, Belichick had two quarterbacks coming in that day for a workout on Monday, just for his emergency list, and they sent him home. They sent him home. They didn't work either quarterback out because they wanted to show Matt Castle they had confidence in him. Mm-hmm. And I and I think that that's what they want to do with Purdy or Josh Johnson. Look, this is this has happened before in the National Football League. We just have short memories and we get caught up in, oh, we got to score, we got to have offense, right? The 72 Miami Dolphins, Bob Greasy gets tackled by Deacon Jones in game five, breaks his leg, uh, breaks his ankle, and, and, and he's out for a while. Earl Morrow comes off the bench and leads them to the playoffs in an undefeated season. I mean, in 1990, Hostetler takes over for Phil Sims and leads them. I mean, go back to Trent Dilfer. I mean, there were three games that the Baltimore Ravens played in 2000. They scored 15 points total, right? And yet they were able to figure it out, and Dilfer was able to make enough plays, and their defense was great. The 49ers' defense can be great. Their special teams can be really good. They they can still win games. Now, Purdy can't come in there and make mistakes. Go back to the playoffs when they went to the Super Bowl. I think he threw it 17 to 18 times against Minnesota and then 11 times against Green Bay. I mean, they won those two playoff games before they played the Chiefs with their defense, their kicking game, and their ability to run it. You know, I think there's something interesting happening in the NFL that I'm a big NBA guy. I know you, I've heard you talk some hoops too. And I, I always yeah, comment a, on like, who would you rather be, the Lakers or the Pelicans? Meaning like you got your bubble championship, but now you have no picks and the Pelicans look like they have a great future and they have all your picks. That's starting to happen where teams have, gotten off their quarterbacks who are vets who can maybe still win they give up a ton of first round picks so if you look at the broncos and the rams who both give up their first round picks they're gonna be pretty high which team out of the broncos or rams do you think sort of in the worst shape for the future because things don't look bright without that first round pick off of the way they played this year well the broncos have the better team they just haven't gotten a good quarterback they've always been a good team without a quarterback the Rams have always been a very talented team with five or six talented players. And when once they got hurt, they are not a very good team. They kind of fell apart. I don't know where Sean McVay is going to be. Does he want to come back and coach or, uh, and really take part in a reconstruction project, which is going to take some time if Matthew Stafford decides to walk away from the game? I think that's a hard one. Look, they went all in. They deserve it. They got it. They were fortunate. You know, there was a couple things that went really well for them. I mean, think about the Tampa game down there in Tampa. You know, Tampa ties the game up and then they convert that third down. They kick the field goal to win the game. And then, you know, they play San Francisco the next week. San Francisco drops an interception. They win that game. They play the Super Bowl, third and 10 from their own 14-yard line. They have false start. Nobody calls it. Cooper Cup gets called for – they call for legal. And next thing you know, and then they don't get it. In a, I mean, they a lot went right. They deserve to win it. Great. But it's going to be a long haul. Denver, to me, is – the problem is what are you going to do with Russell? Like somebody's going to have to have a man-to-man conversation with Russell and say, hey, Russell, you know, you're not the guy. And, you know, they had this with Iverson. And Iverson, what did he say? He said, look, when's the last time an MVP comes off the bench? Well, Alan, you're not an MVP anymore. Russell, you're not the same guy you were anymore. So that's going to be a hard conversation to have. You know, this whole notion that, you know, you can win in the – you can rebuild your team quicker in the NFL than you can in the NBA because it's more of a team – it's more than just one player. But someone is getting fired in Denver, so it's not a very desirable head coaching job. I, I don't think a guy like Sean Payton would want to come in yeah. and take that job. What does Denver do there? Well, I mean, that's a hard one because George Payton, the guy who picked the coach, 
and he picked the quarterback. And not only did he pick the quarterback, he gave him two hundred fifty million. Yeah, I mean those are three. That's three it's strikes, and, and you know you're stuck. And and none of this, the owner approved any of it. The new owner just walks in and says, "Wait a minute, these are your three decisions, and I'm judge. I got to judge you on that." That's a hard thing to do because if when you have that much authority, and a lot of guys, including me, we've never had that much authority in the league. You know, you can have the title GM, but you don't have the authority to do mm -hmm. what George had the authority to do in those situations. And you're going to have to pay the price for it if eventually. That's a hard job. I, I think Denver is going to have to really sit down and figure out what they're doing with Russell before they can start talking to anything else about their organization. And Los Angeles, to me, it really comes down to does Sean want to take part in this rebuilding process? Or is he going to go to Amazon? Or is he going to go to some other TV platform? Uh -huh. Because I, I, you know, I know he redid his contract, but when you don't have a quarterback in the NFL and you don't have any assets to get a quarterback, trust me, that's a hard drive to the stadium Sunday morning. Look, I've realized too, also having that coach in place, finally having one, I think, with Coach Dable with the Giants. But do you think we see Peyton return to the sidelines somewhere? Or is it not, the job's not quite there yet for him, you know? I'd get I think, that well, Amazon I, money. <laughs> I, I think that if Sean had a chance to get to with a great quarterback, like if, say, yeah. something happened with the Chargers, right. you know, the Chargers just are not very good defense. They haven't been, I mean, Brendan Staley's a defense coordinator, and their defense has really not been very good in two years that he's been there. So that's a concern. I mean, they're wasting the, Herbert's great seasons here now. I know Mike Williams is hurt and Keenan Allen's not the same. But, you know, this is really a talented player. And, and they should be better than 6-6, six and six, which is what they are. I think a lot of the – anytime a guy wants to come back in the league, he wants to go somewhere where he has a chance to get a quarterback, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Peterson comes back, he's got Trevor Lawrence. Who, you know, Justin Herbert's sitting there waiting for you if that job opens up. But if you go to Carolina – you know, who's our quarterback? I mean, Matt rules at Nebraska because he couldn't fix the quarterback problem. <laughs> I got a good one for you. And this is the last one for me. Do you think there's any credibility in the rumors that Tom Brady might go back to New England? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I would never put anything past that. I mean, look, I, Tom, when you watch Tom throw and you watch him play, he doesn't look 45. Mm -hmm. You know, and he still seems to have the same competitive nature. I mean, look, he, he's addicted to the process. He's addicted to winning and he's addicted. See, all of us that have been under that program when I was in Cleveland with Bill and then New England, we are products of that system. And, and it's hard for us to look outside of other systems and feel comfortable. And I know how Brady feels. I mean, he's in a different system that's not something he's comfortable with in terms of adjustments how we practice, how we play, all those things. You become institutionalized when you're around that program. And it's how you see the game. It's how I see the game. And so I would never put anything past him. I think he wants that. I think that's something he wants and needs. Were you in Cleveland when Nick Saban was defensive coordinator? Yeah, well, it sure was. Yeah, absolutely. How, yeah. how was he there? You could tell from the first day you went out on the, the first day, you could tell he was going to be a head coach. Now, he just wow. came from Toledo where he was the head coach at Toledo. But you just Nick and Nick had such a commanding presence and a knowledge and the ability to focus and have strategy. You know, a lot of people think yelling is is, you know, is something coaches do. Nick can be demanding, but he also is really smart and he could adjust the game and he understood how to play the game different based on the opponent. You knew it instantly. That's why he's at Alabama. Ozzie Newsom was with us at there, too. Ozzie saw it. Yeah. And so when he had a chance to get him to go to Alabama, Ozzie wasn't going to waste that time. He's scary as hell to interview. I'll tell you that. <laughs> My he's least just, favorite coach you know, to interview. You got to ask the right. It's like Belichick. If you ask yeah. good questions, you're going to get good answers. If yeah. you throw, and I used to say that the scouts all the time in the draft room. If you start dangling stuff out there to him, he's going to just smack it out. You know, you got to throw fastballs against him. You got to throw good. Oh, yeah, I just yeah, got yeah. stressed thinking about asking <laughs> a question to to any of them. Uh, we'll let you go, but I know you got a new book coming out next year, which I am excited for. Yeah. Uh, can you tell our listeners just anything about yeah, it? Because I, I know what it's about. I've heard you talk about it before, but some, something for well, our listeners. You, I appreciate it. It's called Football Done Right. So what I've tried to do is, is basically go over the coaching trees in the NFL, grade the coaches in the NFL, the 517 men that have been coaches, you know, and try to put some understanding around maybe some injustice. Marty Schottenheimer is one of nine coaches in the NFL who've won 200 games. He can't even get up for a Hall of Fame vote. Because, well, he didn't win a big game. He's won 200 games. Only nine men out of 517 have won 200 games. The guy deserves to get in the Hall of Fame. So we talk about that. We talk about the impact of the draft, television, 
you know, and trades, talk a lot about the trades and how trades come down. And then I grade the top 100 players, according to me, over all the eras from one to 100. So it's kind of a, a comprehensive book. It was a it was really a pleasure to write because I, I studied a lot about the game. I got to watch a lot of the great players and see the players. Like when I watched Gail Sayers, I thought, Jesus looks like Tony Pollard to me. You know, there's so many similarities. And now when I watch the game, you know, when I watch pro football with this six back attack, I think I'm watching some of the single wing stuff that was going on before we started to throw the ball by the by when Clark Shaughnessy decided to to, to put the forward pass into pro football. Well, it's always a pleasure having you on. Do you remember who you nicknamed the mayor of Munchkinland on our podcast last time? Well, I know it. It's, it's my man, Kyle Romero. He is the <laughs> yeah. man. I mean, he is the man. Woo. I mean, look, one thing, Buddy Ryan had this great line. He's, Buddy Ryan said, there's a place in football for the little man. It's just not in front of the big man. Yeah. And that's still true <laughs> today. Oh, man, I had to remind you of that. Thanks so much for being on. You can follow Michael on Twitter at M Lombardi NFL. And of course, listen to him every week on the GM Shuffle pod. Michael Lombardi, thank you for being here. Thank you. Jerry, there's nothing like hearing that opening track at 5 a.m. when I'm up with my baby and we binge a bunch of Entourage before the sun comes up, and that's exactly what we did this morning. So I'm about four episodes into season five. I am loving it, and you, I know, really enjoyed making this season. Why? You know, without giving too much away, because I sometimes tend to spoil things for you. Yeah, yeah. yes, you do. Um, yes, you do. But I will say with season five, what I love so much, it really shows you the path for an actor of maintenance that it takes to keep a career going. Uh, all I'll say is like the Vince character does get tested in season five and you really just see what it takes to keep a career going. Cause he's at such a high and then you meet him. He's at such a low in season five. So can we build him back up? You have a lot of fun. I, this is my second favorite season. Uh, season two is number one. Cause we started really figuring it out. And then this season's my second favorite. I'm loving it so far too. I cannot believe how far Vince has fallen. He's bankrupt where I'm in, where I'm at the show. He does the sweet 16. Um, but first, the first episode of season five is Fantasy Island. Where did you guys actually go to shoot that? They say vaguely it's in Mexico. Yeah, it was not in Mexico. Uh, it was actually in Hawaii. So, uh, oh. which, yeah. And look, that, it, it amazing trip to go out there. As you saw in the episode, uh, the turtle character and the Vince character are hiding out there. And then Ari and E and drama take a little seaplane in to come get him because he has like a job offer. So what was cool about that, we saw the whole jet ski thing that we did. And there was even a moment where you saw like these whales. That was all real. We were shooting. Oh and gosh. then, you know, we had walkie talkies on the jet skis. So the guys in the boat were like, cut off your engine, cut off your engine. So we stop our engine. I almost flipped us over the jet skis. <laughs> and these whales just started coming out from the water and they were like swimming alongside us. You have to legally, I think, shut your engines off when they're there. So, uh, but we went right from that scene on the jet skis. I think I showered in like a porter potty in the trailer. We went right to the flight back to LA. Oh we were God. shooting in LA like the next day, but it's a long, it's flight. A long flight too uh, from LA. But that was, that was a lot of fun to shoot. Now, I know you always do these trips like in 48 hours or whatever, like especially the can trip. I cannot believe how quickly you guys were there. Um, but how long were you in Hawaii? I think uh, Hawaii was all in all, I think it was like four days, but it was only two days for, uh, I mentioned like RE -E and drama fly in. They're only in like a bit of that stuff. And then Adrian and I were left there for the extra two days, which was kind of nice because, you know, we'd work a little bit. I got to play some golf. I was like, I think that was my first time in Hawaii too. So, uh, yeah, I got to grow a beard cause we were supposed to, that's where I really started getting the yeah. beard growing out and the hair. Cause, uh, we were supposed to be on the run. Okay. I haven't gotten a chance to ask you about all of your co-stars very much, but since this episode is you and Vince a lot, tell me about what it's like working with Adrian. And especially as you got a couple days, like really just you guys to hang out in Hawaii. Adrian's the best. I, I, you know, he's family. All those guys are family. Adrian was always interesting because uh, he would always tell us, you know, I grew, I was an only child. I didn't have brothers or sisters. So you guys are the closest thing to brothers I have. And all ah. the rest of us all have siblings. So 
Uh, and Adrian was raised by an sh- amazing single mother, stuff like that. Uh, the joke with Adrian, I think the first or second year of the show, we we gave out an award at the ESPYs. Adrian at the time, maybe he's watched sports a little more now, knew nothing, nothing. When I say nothing oh, no. about sports, nothing, zero. We're on the red carpet at the ESPYs. We're doing some interviews. And someone asks Adrian about like the Yankees and who his favorite Yankee is. And he's like, oh, oh no. he doesn't even know Jeter. He didn't even think to say Jeter at the time. This is 15 <laughs> years ago. I just walked by and, I, and you could see it in the clip. I go, Matsumi, Hideki Matsumi. And he's like, I love, uh, you know, uh, Hideki Matsumi. So uh, I claim Adrian's favorite baseball player of all time that I fed him <laughs> on the red carpet at the ESPYs. Okay, that is a good story. Um, I was saying to you off air, and I want people to tweet at us if they'd be interested in this, but I think we should do one whole Entourage episode and have on as many of your peeps one episode and ask them about their favorite sports stories, sports fandom, everything. So if you like that idea, tweet at us. We'll run it by our producer and our bosses. Absolutely. And then, yes, we'll have them on. And then you for sure have to go on the Victory Podcast with Dylan Connolly and Doug Allen because they're they're recapping them in detail. So you'd be a great guest because you're watching in the moment. Right. Very fresh. Very fresh. One more question. Um, Tony Tony Bennett's in an episode. And I mean, what a legend and what was it like shooting with him do you have any funny off off camera story with him it, it was amazing i was i'm a tony bennett fan my mom's the biggest tony bennett fan ever uh <laughs> the only story i really remember uh, I, I i don't think he was too great with some of the language like you know he'd shoot his scene and then he's in the background of ours and then my character's like there's no fucking girls here drama you know you could always feel him be like ah these kids and the cursing why they gotta curse but that he even says that on the show right i think that's he where says, that came mother... from i think yeah yeah I, I think that's he says didn't his mother teach him how to talk right i think he even said like yeah like off camera i've enjoyed the show you guys curse a lot though so i think that's where that came from he just was a class uh, act the whole way around yes. uh yeah him and leighton meester got to do some cool scenes on that stage where they're singing together and then also Leighton Meester, was this like peak Gossip Girl fame as well? Like she was a big deal in the middle of Gossip Girl. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, Leighton did, she was in like episode two, I think of Entourage yeah, and then a few on. episodes here or there. And yeah, this was uh all time high. I think I remember cause it was, you know, we had to work around scheduling and stuff like that with her, sure. but she was always cool. Every time we called and asked her to come back, you know, very, very busy woman at the time, she always came back and- and hung with us. So, uh, yeah, she's definitely uh, got this entourage OG. Did you have Tony Bennett sign anything for your mom or call her or do anything? You know, I didn't and I should have because my mom's maybe the last person on earth who loves an autograph still. Who asks for autographs anymore? Now it's all about the selfie and the yeah. picture. My mom, yeah. if you asked her, would you rather like a selfie with Tony Bennett or his signature? She would pick signature Aww. for sure. She still values the autograph as a, as a thing of memorabilia. So no, I, I didn't. And I should have, but I, I've, I've always had a philosophy with the cameos and stuff we've had. I, I, I'm obviously cool and talk to them and, but I try to give them their space and not nerd out. But Tony Bennett was a tough one not to nerd really? out with. Tom Brady, you said he's coming up. You didn't ask for anything with him? No, Picture. no. But I do think our crew asked for, had conveniently had some footballs and stuff. And to, to Tom Brady's credit, and we'll get yeah. to that episode, he was so patient and signed everything. And he, he was, I swear, he doesn't need any more love that I'm about to give it. He was so cool the one day he worked. He was unbelievable with us and the crew and everyone. Okay, good. Well, I have plenty of early mornings ahead of me that I will continue to watch and get to that episode. I'm yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll end with back in the day when it was airing, most college kids were coming home at 5 a.m. watching Entourage. Right. You are waking up <laughs> at 5 a.m. with your baby watching Entourage. My, how times have changed. Uh, oh, yes, they have. Oh, uh, but I'm loving it. Good. The Lions Lion. All right, it's time for one of my favorite parts of the show. He's back. He, he, he might be in the green. I don't know. We got to total some things up. <laughs> Bet MGM's betting analyst, Peter Andrew. Welcome back, Peter. See, now this crazy, awful parlay I did two weeks ago is starting to make more sense because now we're in the green. We're, we're trending in the right direction here. We're power rankings. I went from 10 to like probably teetering in the top five. Wait, ten, there's, but how many, there's only 10 teams, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We didn't talk about how many teams there were, but 
let me let me get a little bit of energy and excitement here. Well, yeah, you did that that every favorite parlay that got you going. You know, you also were the I don't know how many people were rooting for the tie in the Giants Commanders game. You were one of them because you had what under forty and a half, right? So, yep. Ooh. So line. <laughs> It's crazy. Sweat out that one. Sweat out that one is right. I think it was 20 to 13 with like six minutes left in the fourth quarter. I was like, there is no shot this hits. Sure enough, it hit. So, yeah, I was rooting for the under. Missed field goal at the end by the Giants. So we hit on that for a couple of units. I think that was a three-unit play right there. Mm -hmm. Dolphins, Niners, that was one I was really confident about hitting over, so the over 46 and a half. I think that kind of showed me what I expected, somewhat of a high-scoring uh, game there. Um, and then the teaser, which almost hit. So the teaser, we had Browns minus one. I think we collectively were talking about feel good there. Chiefs over 46 and a half. So even though they lost the game and then Dolphins plus 10. So that late touchdown, that fumble by Tua, Dre Greenlaw put it in the end zone. That actually killed it. So that would have been an extra seven units there. But we stayed above. We're about two, three units up last week. So, so we're going to continue to trend in the right direction here. Peter, I got to ask you, have you ordered your Brock Purdy jersey yet? Uh, funny that you say that is because I was just at my desk and I was about to pull the trigger and order. Do it. No. <laughs> why not? Yeah, you're Mr. Irrelevant. I love it. Are, are you worried about your team? Uh, yeah, I think this week's going to show a lot. I think he played really well, but I'm also yeah. not sold on the Dolphins defense. Um, you saw it. They were sending seven, eight people at once to try to contain mm -hmm. him, which is never a good sign for a guy who's probably never to start a game, especially this year, but probably looking at a Bucks team. If Levante David's healthy, I know he got shaken up on Monday night, um, a, a more worthy defense here, but again, looking at it the other way, I think they're going to be able to build a little bit of a sch uh, schematic offense around what he can and can't do. So it's going to be a really telling week on, uh, on Sunday. The Bucks can't score. So that gets right into my first pick. Okay, let's go. That's a transition is what we call in the business, folks. That's, a transition. <laughs> that, is, that is like you read about it. So uh, Brock Purdy, Jimmy G, Trey Lance kind of didn't matter for me. Niners defense is playing unbelievable. Wow. Seven points in the second half in the last five games. That is a number one ranked defense. Nick Bosa has somehow slotted himself back in the conversation for DPOY oh. with Parsons. He has 13 and a half sacks now. So he's... He's playing real, real it's like an good football. All pro season. He's incredible. Amazing. So their defense versus a Bucks offense that just frankly can't do anything. Uh, Niners are minus four. So I have four units on that one. We've taken that one unit we normally put on an OGP and taken that out this week. The Thursday game is awful, and I just don't know which way to go on that. So we're going to go four units. So that's forty dollars to win seventy six. Niners minus four. Uh, third straight game for the Niners at home. I think they're starting to get more healthy. Defense is fully back. I think they are probably the team to beat, maybe outside the Eagles uh, in the end. So, Pete, I'm going to actually, and I'm looking at BetMGM right now, it's actually minus three and a half. So, I'm getting you that so, number. But we're going to give you, I say three yeah. and a half, because you would have you so waited until right now. So, it's getting even better, Niner fans. Yeah, so it looks like there's a <clears throat> potentially a little bit of sharp money going the opposite way. Um, but that's what I want to see. Yes. Because uh, I think that is... Um, that's a Niners team that can disrupt them to a way different degree than the Saints did yesterday. And frankly, lucky that they pulled out that win in the last minute and a half. So you got four units there, 40 to win 76. Are you, are you teasing? Are you parlaying the rest of the way? Yeah, so we're going two different teasers here. So we had some success last week on the totals. So I want to start with that. So we're doing all three overs here. So we've teased them down six right. points. So it's... Finns Chargers, we've teased that down to 46 and a half. I think that's, again, another high-scoring game. You have pretty potent offenses. Herbert had a tough week last week versus the Raiders, but um, I think that is a, a probably a high-scoring matchup. Two teams really, really fighting for that potential last couple playoff spots because the Chargers are right there. Dolphins start a little bit of skid. They can put themselves in a bad spot. So I see that as a high-scoring one out in L.A., Second one, over 41 and a half. So this is a really appetizing number to me going down that six points for browns Bengals. I think you saw Watson start to get a bit more familiar with playing. That's been two years. Um, they looked fairly well against the Texans, which is not saying much, but um, I think there'll be some points there and obviously playing the Bengals who are just absolutely rolling right now. Again, see that being a, probably a 45 to 50 point game collectively. Um, and then the last one, 
this is the one that I think is a little bit tricky, but it's over 47 and a half in the Vikings Lions games uh, game. That, that's two teams that can put up points. And as we've seen early in the season, and then again, more recently, the Lions give up a lot of points. So I can see this again being a, an absolute shootout. This could be a 40 to 35 ish score kind of, kind of game. Uh, so three units, 30 to win 72. So as always, that's that plus 140 mark right there for three teams. Um, what do you guys think about that one? So I'm going all overs here, which is always risky, but mm-hmm. it's risky, but you're the fun guy at the bar who's rooting for the over. You're not yeah, like the that, over is that always fun. Dick who's rooting for I the under. To, <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I have to balance it after last week rooting for the tie. So yeah, no, um, I, I, I like so, yeah. it and I agree. I'm still trying to wrap my head on the, Olivia and I were talking that the lions are minus two and a half in that game. So I wouldn't even want to touch a side in nope. that game, but I do like points. I, 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 I'm actually going to mirror that teaser on my own. I think I love that one. But yeah, if and Vegas is predicting a close game, two and a half points, then you got to like the Vikings there. I, you know, if, if they're nine and zero in one score games. So if you're, I, that's why I like the over P I like your play. Yeah. There's some really, really questionable lines this week that and that's one of them. And we'll get into some that I've teased either down or up. It seems like a really, really weird week in the NFL. So Staying away from those to your guys' point there. Um, for the second teaser, so this is all spreads. So we're going uh, kind of a back and forth approach here. First one, Texans are plus 17. Um, that is a big number, especially where I'm going to tease it up to 23. I mean, I, they're still an <laughs> NFL team at the end of the day. Um, that's way too many points for me to pass up. I was considering yeah. taking the, the Cowboys down, but I think playing with three scores plus, I think is a pretty safe bet. Although they are a pretty poor team, I think they still have a lot to play for. I think Damian Pierce still can be a premier running back in the league. I think they have lots to, to prove to themselves. So don't see them winning that game. Uh, I think that's pretty clear, but I see it being somewhere around a 10 to 14 point game. The plus 23 there. Chiefs going to Denver. That was a minus nine. I've teased that down to minus three. Uh, Chiefs coming off tough loss. Denver got absolutely killed by Carolina. Um, I think three points there is pretty pretty favorable, all things considered. So Chiefs bounce back week, probably the best team in the AFC. I think they look they'll be just fine. Um, and then last one, Browns. I've teased that up from plus six to plus twelve versus the Bengals. Again, same game we touched in the uh, in the totals. Uh, I think they'll look a bit better with Deshaun Watson. He looked pretty shaky, kind of first couple of drives on uh, one o'clock on Sunday, but I think he got back into his own rhythm uh, as needed. Um, so I think that's generally a closer game than two scores. Uh, still think Bengals win at home, but again, a seven point game and still gives us some points to work with there. So I think pretty good, all things considered. Um, and then again, $30 to win 72. So the same plus 140. Um, and can put ourselves in a good position here. And we're playing with, I think, uh, a couple of different totals and a couple of different spreads that are pretty appealing with those six points. Pete, you know, I, I'm okay. sorry I questioned your strategy of getting on base a few weeks ago because it's working. Sorry, Olivia. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, good stuff, Pete. Hey, why we have all of our mics open and hot, I want to wish a uh, congratulations to one of our friends and fellow employees, Zach Gaynor, who welcomed a baby girl this week. Congrats. Very excited. He did. Very listening. exciting. Hope he's sleeping. Yes. Yeah. While he can. <laughs> he won't be for... I'm seven months out and I'm not sleeping. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, Pete, thanks so much. A lot of fun. If you see Zach before we do, tell him congratulations yes. from all of us at Unleashed. Make sure you subscribe to the Unleashed podcast presented by BetMGM YouTube channel. That's right. You can watch us, not just listen to my hoarse voice after an exciting football weekend. And we hope to see you guys every week after this. Subscribe anywhere you find your podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.